want to do just put the recording on and no problem okay. and, and just ask the ask the you start the conversation and mm -hmm. i will respond you yeah, ask the I, question so i, I respond I, I just hit record because we already sort of got into a really important bit here because you just reminded me of how important it is to do everything one does, even the so-called mundane daily things like doing the dishes or the, um, making the bed or chopping wood and carrying water in a, in a Zen way. Um, yeah. with, with love and full attention as a, as, a, as a meditation. And I shared with you that I'm currently quite burned out and, and exhausted with an overstretch that I've created for myself in my life. And it's actually been over the last few years, over a few weeks, um, six, seven weeks since I knew that we were speaking. Um, this lesson has come back to me from when I first met you at Schumacher College over 20 years ago. And, and we were invited to be part of the college community, to clean the toilets, to um, uh, help with the, 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 the cleaning um, team in general, and to, um, and to do the cooking. Yeah. And for me, that coming home into daily action, into in this hyper virtual world where everybody is doing everything virtually, into the analog relationship with yeah. life yeah. is is actually what is the only thing that's healing me at the moment in my overwhelm. Like I, I find that the minute I come and give full time and attention and no haste to taking care of daily affairs, to being with my daughter, to taking care of the land that I've now come a, a custodian of, um, that's when I feel regenerated. And, and when I spin into the virtual possibilities and stories I, I get confused because I also, and this is something that I, I wanted to ask you in the, also in this conversation, I think one of the pressures that I sense at the moment, and you have such a long lifetime perspective on this, you've been an activist for all your life since you since you joined the the, the Jane Monastery as a, as a child, and when you when, when you left it, and in your time with the Nova Power and and then the the long walk um, for peace in the 1960s, I mean you you're a living legend. Um, you you're a real um, wise elder to humanity now. And how, having seen this long trajectory and the long civil rights and ecological movement develop over the last 50 years. What's your reading of where we're at as humanity? Have have we, uh, in all this time, have we progressed or have we, are we still fighting a deeply unsustainable pattern or not fighting is the wrong word, but, but are we still confronted with the fact that we are killing life and in the process ourself? Yes. And, and increasingly the signs are such that it's no longer about how to build an eco-utopia in the future. It's coming exactly to what we were saying, down to the moment, into the presence, with the communities we find ourselves in, and live regeneratively from, from a kind of hope like Václav Havel's type of hope. It's not knowing that things will turn out all right. It's knowing that they're worthwhile anyway. That's is true. Yes, yes, yes. No, that is the the most important uh, question that you have raised. It's a question about life itself. And I feel that humanity, ever since it came into existence, has always faced the problem of um, negative and positive, and how to balance between the two like Chinese call it yin and yang. So from the time of the Buddha, Jesus Christ, uh, and all the uh, great people in between, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Hildegard of Bingen, all these women and men, they have shown us uh, that humanity has always faced a problem, suffering, pain, and 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 uh, and anger, all those things, and now we are even facing greater problem of climate change, biodiversity diminishing, 
earth in a kind of struggle to survive. So problems have always been there and will always be there. So what I see is that problems are also an opportunity. Colonialism and imperialism gave Mahatma Gandhi an opportunity to do something about it. Apartheid gave Nelson Mandela an opportunity to bring a kind of equanimity in South Africa. Martin Luther King faced the problem of racism and that gave him an opportunity. So problems are there and no one individual is, you can say, responsible for it. We are all participating in this problem. Um, and therefore, we all need to find also solution. We all need to work together. And so um, without getting too worried about it, because we are not in charge of the whole world. We are not in control of the whole world. We are in charge of our action, our thinking, and our way of being. And so as an elder, you called me, and also the experience of walking around the world, meeting Martin Luther King, that was a great privilege for me. He was an embodiment of love and equanimity in spite of what he was facing, racism and, and many other um, problems. Uh, he was in prison 29 times in 10 years period of his life. And yet he was full of love. When I met him, not a, not a shred of anger or fear or, or anything like that. So if we can see that example, that if we can act to bring about transformation, if we can do whatever we can do to serve the world with love, with humility, but without expecting immediate results and outcome for ourselves. Martin Luther King did not know that one day a black man could be in the White House as the president of the United States of America, Barack Obama. But it doesn't matter if he knew or did not know, he did his best. So without taking burden on our shoulders, without expecting any results, outcome in our lifetime, we do act and do service with a sense of love and a sense of compassion and a sense of giving. And if we give, then we receive. The universe is based on the principle of reciprocity. So this is what I have learned mm -hmm. from my life, 86 years of life, as you mentioned, from monkhood to being a Gandhian, walking around the world, editor of resurgence, founder of Shumaka College, all these things, what I have been engaged with, what I have learned from it, they were all offering as a service. No attachment, no nothing more than just a little offering. In the great river of transformation, I'm a small tributary. But small, small tributaries make the great river. So you are a tributary, Daniel. I'm a tributary. And, in, and by being a tributary, we are contributing to the greatness and the wholeness of the movement for transformation. And we can be happy and satisfied and contented, totally contented, and celebrate ourselves being a tributary. That's all I can say. It's comforting. The, I guess what what's... What was also in my question was this, like you, you, you've probably met Jem Bendel and you've heard about the deep adaptation movement and um, increasing voices that of people that get very quickly branded as collapsists, like the, what people like Jonas Sark, the inventor of the um, polio vaccine, started to work on after that in the 1960s um, and that Dennis Meadows and Olena Meadows was working on with um, the Limits to Growth report in um, at the late 60s and early 70s was a warning to humanity that if we continued business as usual, we would hit a wall around 2030 to 2050 that would mean enormous suffering of life on earth. Schumacher College 
um, beloved teacher who recently um, merged into wholeness, uh, James Lovelock, um, in his later part of his life was was very clear that that his reading of where things were going is a world with 500 million people, not 10 billion people by the end of this century. But that's a scientific statement that has a trauma and a horror attached to it that is unspeakable because it would mean more people being born until the middle of the century and then billions dying in the second half of this century. Um, all the kind of predictions on energy shortages, food shortages now accelerated through the war in Ukraine, the possibility of um, not being able to fertilize the industrial agricultural system that we've become dependent on despite the fact that it's killing ourselves and the planet, um, and therefore having massive harvest failures in the coming years. What, what, what I'm trying to get at is that over the last 50 years, we were trying to contribute to a larger river. And now there is a sort of question to my mind, would we act as activists, as people who activate healing, loving action in place and region? Um, in a different way, if we assumed that cascading collapses are the near future and middle future, like the, the, the next five to 15 years, and that we really have to get people to invest humanity's resources in building the capacity, very Schumacherian, at the local and regional scale to meet these changes we now almost know for certain that are going to come at us in order yes. to make the suffering as little as possible. Do you see what I mean? It's 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 a slight yeah. different. Like the urgency has just been cranked up, or we've 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 lagged in systemic response for forty five years, and and now we have very little time left. Maybe. Um, yeah. What's your take on that? Now, first of all, I would like to say that we should not try to be kind of forecasters, mm -hmm. like um, uh, like uh, astrologers. Yeah. and say what is going to happen in 10, 15, 20, 50 years' time. Um, I'm more interested in acting in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And and if collapse comes, I met Jem, and, and I think he has got a good three or four words, which I like. He is talking about resilience. He's talking about relinquishment. He's talking about um, uh, regeneration. So he's saying that we should prepare ourselves for any uh, catastrophe which might come. And that I agree. Precaution principle is always good. But also at the same time, I do not want to be gripped mm -hmm. by fear. Yeah. Because if you are gripped by fear of the future, then you are not going to act in a sustainable and, and a regenerative way. Mm -hmm. and, and like an enthusiastic and inspira inspirational way. So I would like to focus more on the present moment. And I would like to say that what is going to collapse is not the world, not the earth, but this industrial civilization. Because if energy runs out, we are not going to have cars and aeroplanes and, and, and all the modes of transportation. If energy runs out, we are not going to have all the factories and so on. But I think human beings will survive. Mm -hmm. And we, and Earth will survive. That's my hope and my prediction. And the land is not going to stop producing trees, apples and mangoes and oranges and bananas. And the soil is not going to stop producing grain like rice and wheat and barley and vegetables and fruit. And so if we can bring back those skills and train young people to learn, to grow food, to build house, to make clothes, to make furniture, to make pottery, to make things. And, and, and if collapse comes of the industrial civilization, nothing, nothing to worry. I will dance and sing because this industrial civilization is bringing global warming and climate change and the pollution of our oceans and pollution of our rivers. We don't want this kind of 
uh, progress, progress, progress. What this civilization is telling us that humans don't need to be makers. We don't need to produce anything. Machine will produce everything. Technology will produce everything. Mm. And we don't need to think. Humans don't need to have brain. Cars will be driverless cars. And, 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 and the houses will be built by machines. And, and farming will not be done by farmers. It will be done by robots. Artificial intelligence will drive everything. And so, so, so industrial civilization is doomed because it is following a path which eliminates the human um, intelligence and human action and makes humans mere consumers. You don't need to do anything. Just buy, buy, buy and consume, consume, consume. You don't need to think. You don't need to make. You don't need to do. You don't need to act. Everything will be by machine, artificial intelligence. So I don't think we want to save this kind of civilization. If, it, it, if this collapses, let it collapse. I don't worry. But what we need to do is, in the meantime, learn the skills of growing food, building house, making clothes, making furniture, and connecting with, the, with each other, and living a simple, frugal, but delightful, joyful, elegant simplicity, elegant life. Mm -hmm. But I don't worry about the future so much as James Lovelock or even uh, Jim Bendel. Uh, James, uh, Jim is, um, I'm going to give a little um, podcast with him uh, soon. Um, in a week or so, he has engaged me and 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 made an appointment. Oh, he came to see me in my house in Ford House in Heartland. Um, but I don't worry too much about the future. I'm worried about the present moment. How can we live today so that tomorrow is a better tomorrow? I mean, this is what you like me inspired by you and you for much much longer than that. Um, we've we've been somewhat doing like Schumacher College, Gaia Education's courses on um, giving people those capacities to act exactly li like you were describing, making a difference in their place and their region. For, for me, it's just like that the question I was having is may maybe we can't change the big conversation of the World Economic Forum and all these, these big meetings of people who are supposedly saving the planet. Um, and but at the same time, if we dedicated more resources on building what Schumacher and um, Schumacher College or Gandhi with with Swaraj with self reliant with the self reliance movement in India have already pioneered over the last century and 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 the beginning of this century, um, scaling that out, not up, um, enabling people in every place to stop solving grow, uh, local problems and start manifesting local potential. Like one of the beautiful framings, um, rather than in the problem lies the solution used to be the is the permaculture way of framing it, but the the, the, the Cara Sanford and Regenesis group um, highlight that in this problem solving attitude is also a problem. We, we we because we end up abstracting more and more and then trying to find solutions that we then force on different places. And at the core of acting regeneratively is really seeing the potential in each person, in each community, in each collective team, and in each place. And enabling people in place to manifest that potential and and that's what what I feel Schumacher College's education has done to me um of of, of putting me on this path and not just me many, many thousands of students that are now all over the world and because of this sense of urgency which is maybe where I'm mistaken um how how do we enable people people to do this like i i right now in my very personal life i'm caught in a dynamic where i'm involved in lots of local resilience building projects that are beginning to start to create dynamics yes that, yes and and at the same time the global pro, uh, projects that invite me to work with are the ones that pay my family's living so yeah. i'm again in this pulled between these two worlds and and i'm asking for advice from from a mentor and an elder about how 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 to 
Like I, I hear you and in many, many ways, that's where my heart wants to go, to just leave that bigger story alone and make it very small, make it this piece of land and my neighbors for a while and yeah. pay yeah. attention to my daughter and my family for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the thing is that uh, I'm a man of action and a man of hope, active hope. So action requires worry less and act more. Mm -hmm. So we are not in charge of the whole world. You and I are not, in, even people who are in charge of the world, like um, um, Biden, president of the United States, and Putin, president or whatever he is of the uh, Soviet Union or Russia, or all the big, big people, they are not in charge either. Nobody is in charge, but they think they are in charge. <laughs> so we are not in charge of the world, but co-creation, we do our best. We act, not worry, but act, do. Be the radiators so that we can warm the room. The radiators of love, radiators of action, radiators of uh, revolution even, love revolution. And so uh, we need to, without worrying and without seeing the problem, whatever, whatever there is, of course, the big problems. But what can I do? Mm. I can change myself first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Be the change that I want to see in the world. I will live a simple, elegant, and beautiful life for myself. If everyone does that, there'll be change. I will eat less meat or no meat. I will less travel an aeroplane less. I will live a good life. So if we can start with ourselves, then I communicate. I communicate like you are a good communicator, Daniel. Your book has been wonderful. So communicate. Simone de Beauvoir communicated by writing her books, The Second Sex. Picasso communicated through painting uh, Guernica. Uh, John Lennon and Bob Dylan and many other singers communicated through their songs. So through singing, painting, writing, speaking, uh, whatever way you can do, communicate these words as much as you can without worrying and without burning out. Mm -hmm. That is our responsibility. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is that we must join others. Work is a co-creation. No one person can change the world. Mahatma Gandhi was joined by hundreds of thousands of Indians. Nelson Mandela was joined by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Um, all the movements, big, big movements, uh, the, the suffragette movement were joined by millions of women around the world. Then they got the voting right. So join, everybody should join each other without ego, mm. without arrogance without kind of um, uh, separation, but with a humility and, and a love. If we join others and co-create the movement for transformation and change, do that and then do not worry about the results. Do not worry about any kind of outcome. Do not expect anything. Like Martin Luther King, I said, Mahatma Gandhi said, I can wait for 100 years before independence comes, but it must be non-violent independence. And so act in the right way, noble ends must be achieved by noble means. Mm -hmm. Means and ends must congruent. So with noble ends and noble means, we act every day with love, without any burnout, without any worry. Worry will burn you out more than your action. And so just do your best and live in the hands of the universe. If the, if the universe wants to collapse itself, I'm not going to stop it. I'm not going to be in charge of it. If the earth wants to collapse, I'm not going to stop it. Um, so I'm, but I'm going to do my best to serve uh, the earth and serve the, uh, plant the trees, do the gardening, do the cooking, do the washing up with love, and then also write a book with love and speak with love and start Schumacher College with love. And do it day after day. Be an activist with hope, active hope. But do not worry about the world. Mm -hmm. Worry will not solve the problem. Action can help to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, I mean, this has been really helpful for me personally because it's it's sort of very affirming that somewhere in myself I feel as as you kindly suggested I've done a little bit small bit with the book and the, maybe doing too much in the last few years of of trying to communicate on too many channels and being involved in too many networks and in many ways I feel a really strong need to come to that simplicity of really letting this half acre a half hectare of um food forest that i planted over the last two years transform me and um, by being in loving relationship with the land and giving it the attention like that i always like what may east who you also met um, in fintown once um she she gave me this new framing of activists are people like what activism is is to ask every day what story do i activate with the power of my attention and intention today yes and it's it's really beautiful and and i i have this sense that while part of me feels retreating into working on the land and eco retrofitting the house and being a good dad for my little five and a half year old daughter is pulling away from the world and the responsibilities that I'm put onto myself. And at the same time, somewhere in my larger being is this understanding that precisely through doing that, I may do some learning and I already have done some learning in the last two years with the land and, and with slowing down that is actually the next thing that I might be able to communicate meaningfully to somebody. So if if there is a second book in me that wants to be written, it is yeah. about not solving global problems and worrying about global trajectories that are worrisome. Yeah. But it is about the future potential of the present moment, what you were speaking to, coming home to the present moment and doing yeah. what can be done. And and of course, the the, the problem there is that that is a voice of privilege as well, because of course, right now I can do that more easily than other people could just stop and say, I, I'm I'm paying attention to um, the land and my family. But, yeah. but, but, but so I am, I'm also kind of self aware that taking this path, I can take it because I have a certain privilege of where I live and what I've done so far, but, um, we are privileged, yeah. uh, but for that privilege, we have to feel gratitude. And with that gratitude, we can practice humility. And 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 with gratitude and humility, we can say that if this um, privilege has been given to me, I will use it with care. Because if you use that privilege with care, mm -hmm. then... Uh, we can use that privilege to serve the humanity, serve our precious planet Earth um, in a small way, whatever small way we can. And and if everyone, and, and we can inspire by our example, mm -hmm. we can inspire others by our example. And, and you know, we don't need to be too pessimistic because at the moment, there are millions of young people around the world who are waking up and raising their voice. Um, uh, sort of uh, Fridays for the Future is a big movement. And many, many young people in Africa, in Asia, in, in South America, in countries like that, are raising their voice and starting new projects, starting uh, gardens, farms, uh, crafts. Uh, many, many good projects are starting around the world. I don't feel too pessimistic. I think there is a whole generation of young people who are refusing to learn the old style economics. They are refusing, challenging the universities uh, that uh, they should change their educational system and they should teach what is really relevant. So, I mean, the, the, uh, of course I understand and I know this is still a very minority movement, but it's a big minority. It's a big minority. I was at Oxford Real Farming Conference 
um, just in the beginning of January. And there were 2,000 people in person present there. And many of those 2,000 people, many of them were young people. I was very impressed and inspired to see 2,000 people coming to talk about real farming, organic, and permaculture, and caring for the land. And we are not the owners of the land. We have a relationship with the land. We are carers for the land. And the 3,000 people online. So these small, I mean, you talked about Davos, but mm -hmm. I think Oxford Real Farming Conference is the real, real yeah. grassroots movement. So we should not ignore the rising and, and, and emerging grassroots movement for transformation and change. So I feel quite inspired. And I but, don't think that world is going to um, collapse in the way some people are predicting. I think that there, there is a new generation of young people who are going to create a new way of life. Yeah, I mean, another um, good friend of yours and, and somebody who I met shortly after me meeting you at, at Schumacher College 20 years ago, uh, more than 20, 22 years ago, um, Helena Norberg-Hodge, still a very strong voice, voice for... Um, both coming back to the ancient future of understanding our, us again in the indigenous worldview of we are expressions of life, we are expressions of place, we never have been owners. It it was always a story that we told ourselves. We, we Life flows through us, we don't own it. And in, in that, Helena has been for decades, a strong voice for the relocalization and now also re-regionalization movement. And I think that's where, where I feel that this, we, we can square this circle, uh, circle the square um, in, in the sense of even if voices like collab collapses and deep adaptation voices have their point about where things might be going, by focusing on the positive of empowering young people and everybody in localities to do what, what Gandhi suggested so long ago, to, to increase self-reliance, to build what, what the current economic system has cut away redundancies. Oh, we can do this at a bigger scale, more efficiently, so let's close down sm 10 small bakeries and make one big bakery. Um, it's what we're now seeing is a reverse of that, of, of vibrant local economies popping up again as this globalized system is beginning to fail. And people realize that investing in local supply lines, building relationship with local farmers, connecting, healing the local ecosystem with how we grow our food in that ecosystem, and healing the local ecosystem with how we grow the biomaterials for having a good life even if we don't have this high technological life anymore that you, you were saying, in many ways, the way you were describing that te high tech industrial growth society future that people are trying to sell us, um, that's not a future worth living for. And, 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 and I hope that we run out of energy and materials before anybody manifests mm -hmm. more of that. Actually, I am quite sympathetic to a uh, deep adaptation idea yeah. in the sense that uh, what I understand, and I need to understand a bit more, but collapse is collapse of the industrial system, yeah. and and the and, and the high energy and energy intensive based agriculture and and production system. This is going to collapse. So we need to adapt. And what is adaptation? That's where I think Helen Norberg Hodges' work that you mentioned yeah. is complementary to. James' work of deep adaptation exactly. by going local, by having self-reliance, by having more skilled society where we are able to make and build and live elegant simplicity and, and a, not a wasteful uh, lifestyle and not a polluting lifestyle. That is deep adaptation. We are adapting to a new situation where we are going to become active again in as a makers, artists, craftsmen, uh, artisans, and that is the kind of answer. So I, if you put those two together, uh, Jem Bendel and Helena Norberg Hodge together, deep adaptation and a local self-reliant economic system, and then with that trinity will be 
a more spiritual approach to life so that our fulfillment and our joy and our satisfaction is not dependent on money, profit, um, kind of growth uh, and, and a kind of um, uh, extravagant lifestyle. But our contentment and happiness and joy is rooted in our own uh, spirituality, love, poetry, art, music, friendship, family, gardening, being in nature and being contented in that sort of way. That is deep adaptation. That's a kind of um, uh, resilience and, uh, and uh, uh, relinquishment and, and all those words that Jem is using. So I think those two movements can be complementary to each other. Yeah, I, I think another expression of that same impulse or movement is this growing, like I was part um, in, in autumn last year, there was a global online summit on bioregional regeneration. And in it, people were calling in from all over the world where, where the, that are already active in their local region. Yeah. On a, it is a localization agenda, but it is a localization agenda at a scale of the watershed. It's not a localization yeah, yeah, yeah. agenda in the kind of transition town um, way of my neighborhood, my little village but the next scale out. And I, I think to really localize, we need to also regionalize because yeah. so many things that, that we do ideally still have in a low energy future um, need to be organized regionally. And, and, and that's where I think that's also where these two worlds somehow meet and why I, like my, my sense is it, it's much more healthy to focus on the local and regional and leave the global to somebody else. And the in in the question I was asking earlier is is this this thought oh, if we could only spark a top down and bottom up agreement on in response to what's coming at us we do need to pay attention to regional economies, bio -re like ecosystems regeneration at, at the, at the bioregional scale. And, and the global problems that we still have meetings in, in the COPs and all this about can only be solved at the local and bioregional scale through making this shift away yeah. from the problem to yeah. the manifestation of local potential. There is huge potential in every ecosystem to be healed if we take our role as ecosystems custodians seriously. We we yeah. know how to heal ecosystems. And yeah. 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 No, I agree with you totally. And I think bioregional uh, idea. So minimum, um, minimum power at the centralized and a top level and a maximum power in a decentralized and a local level. And the local can go a little bit higher and higher and higher. So um, what can be produced and made locally in my sort of North Devon area uh, where I live, I will do that. But then my bio region is in my whole district of Devon. And then even you can say West Country, which yeah. includes Devon, Cornwall, Somerset, Dorset. And yeah. that is the kind of my bio region. And then a national economy of, of England uh, can be very small, say maybe 10, 15 percent, and maybe European economy can be five percent, and maybe world economy can be one or two percent. Mm -hmm. So we can have a little bit of luxury, like tea or coffee or something like that, but we don't have to have import cheese from uh, Australia or butter from Australia or 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 some milk from New Zealand, something like that. So I think it's bioregional and a local and resilience decentralized. A system of economics uh, is more important. Mm -hmm. But for me, also, I, I, as you can understand, being a Gandhian and a spiritual person, I feel that our agriculture and our craftsmanship and our artisan work should be a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. We are producing food, but it's working on the land and, and working on the soil is a great sense of joy and a kind of relationship with the land is a great source of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And so producing food is a gift. Yeah. We yeah. get as a kind of gift from the nature, but just being in the service of nature and planting the trees and looking after the trees and composting the soil and building the soil 
is like meditation for me. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in the garden, I feel so joyful and so happy. And you are looking after uh, your land, which is so wonderful. So if we can have this consciousness that working is a good thing. At the moment, our industrial system tells you that working is a bad thing. Work should be eliminated and nobody should have to work. Uh, work should be done by machine. I think that whole idea needs to change. Working, good work is good work. And that's a sense of joy, that's a sort of poetry, that's a sort of music, and that's a sort of art, that's a craft. Agriculture is a craft. Gardening is an art. Um, uh, building a house is an art and craft. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it should be a creativity. And it needs imagination. It's a poetry. And so I want to make a bit broader meaning of economics than mm. just a kind of um, uh, kind of pragmatic uh, uh, survival uh, mechanism yeah, yeah. that by producing food and clothes and houses, we survive. It's a more than survival. It's a way of proper, joyful living. No, I mean, this reminds me strongly of, of conversations I've had over the years with, I've, I've always been fascinated. I think if my parents had educated me in a way that would have put side by side an academic education and a and a kind of more hands-on um, apprenticeship education, I might have become a, a carpenter and, and, and timber framer. Um, yeah. And, and the, you know, the, the German guilds, the old medieval guilds that still walk around with these black um, corduroy suits and and white vest, uh, black vests and white shirts. And they they have a tradition that goes all the way into like the 1100s um, of, being craftsmen and 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 they they sing songs that have only been um continued in that lineage for hundreds of years orally they tell stories that have never been written down and and one of their like very aligned to what you just said one of their core teachings to their young apprentices is that every bit of work you do as you work the timber or work the wood is an expression of your spirit your yeah. breath yeah. that goes into the material yeah. and you only have in a lifetime so many breaths to take and every breath you made it better make it worth it every breath so it's it's it makes a beautiful circle to where we started of the simple things in life like if we both our work and our craft but also our washing up and our being with with the land all of it becoming a celebration of the gift of life. That, that absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That is absolutely my. I feel uh, that we need to do, and we need to learn that in our schools and universities and colleges. This is where education of head, education of heart, education of hands is very important. At the moment, when you go to a university or a college, teachers will look at you and they think that you have no heart, you have no hand, you have no body. You have only brain mm. and only half brain because there's no right hemisphere in our education, only left hemisphere of the brain. Reasoning and, and, a, and a kind of organization, management, measurement, all that is educated and taught, uh, but no right hemisphere of the brain, no intuition, um, no imagination, no creativity, no spirituality, and no heart and no hands. So we need to... Uh, and therefore, our young people are conditioned to think that there's nothing else in the world than measurement and, and a consumption and all that. Mm -hmm. So if we can bring head, heart and hands into our education, in our schools and universities, and every school in the whole world should have a garden, yeah. even before you have a swimming pool, should have a garden. Before mm -hmm. you have a scientific lab, you have a garden. Because garden is a real science lab. When you see the miracle of nature that one seed becoming a tree or one seed becoming a, a tomato plant and how one seed can give you 100 tomatoes or 100 apples or 1,000 apples, that miracle needs to be experienced by children. Yeah. So no school should be without a garden. No yeah. university should be without a farm. No college should be without some land. And teachers, professors, lecturers, chancellors, vice chancellors, Whoever you are, students, staff, everybody needs to work on the land. So this is this is where the humanity can survive and flourish uh, and, and, and a kind of blossom if we 
go back and embrace nature. Nature is our teacher. Nature is our spiritual guide. If we can be like nature, as equanimous and generous and kind and compassionate, we will be fine. There will be no problem in the world. But we have lost our connection with nature and we have not seen nature as our teacher and as our spiritual guide. And this is why we are lost. We've lost, We even in, in our language use, tend to other nature as if it's nature and humanity as two separate things rather than humanity as expression of nature, which it, it is and, and never has been differently. It's, it's just we, we're not aligned with life's regenerative patterns. And the whole core of the regenerative culture impulse, to, to my mind, is a coming back to understanding that we would not be here as human beings if our ancestors, our great, 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 great grandfathers and grandmothers would not have been regenerative in place, living in as wise expressions of that place, not, not as owners of that place. Absolutely. You mentioned indigenous cultures and indigenous wisdom. I mean, if you go to uh, people who have lived for millions of years on the land in, in the Amazon forest or indigenous people in South America or, or Aboriginal people in Australia, they have never seen nature and humans as separate. Mm -hmm. Humans are as much nature as mountains and forests and animals and birds. We are nature. There is no separation in indigenous cultures. It's the Western industrial and, and a kind of technological and a mechanistic uh, paradigm that we have separated nature and humans. And once you separate, then you start to think that not only we are separate from nature, but we are better than nature. And not only we are better than nature, we are superior to nature. We are above nature. We are higher than nature. And therefore, we can do to nature what we like. So we treat nature as our slave. We treat nature as something inferior and it's only a resource for the economy. But the indigenous cultures saw nature as mother, as father, sky father, and, and the sun and the rain and the moon and, and everything was like relatives. Uh, the birds in the sky were our members of our family. That's the indigenous wisdom. Um, the, the tigers and, and elephants and, and the deer in the forest are our members of our family. That indigenous wisdom that you mentioned is a very important to reclaim and learn from them. We have to be humble. Uh, we have seen indigenous people as backward, uneducated, not smart, not developed. Uh, they are kind of uncivilized, uh, kind of savage. That is a big mistake. We have to be humble and learn from indigenous people how they have maintained good life for millions of years. And we, industrial uh, humanity, in the last 500 years, we have made a mess of the world. Mm -hmm. So we have to be humble and learn from indigenous people. Remembering we're all indigenous to life. It's like I, I've had this conversation with a number of indigenous elders in the, in the last year, year and a half, because I was a bit concerned that like in the rediscovery of the importance of that message of our belonging to and us as expressions of more than human nature, um, we, we're starting to give more value again to indigenous voices, but also because we've seen that the world's biodiversity hotspots are the lands that have been managed by indigenous people over the last few hundred years and not the ones that that have been managed by large corporations and and um but but i think that there's a danger if we create yet another false dualism between indigenous people and non-indigenous people because to some extent we are all indigenous to life and and the kind of colonialization that has happened to the global south indigenous cultures through european globalized uh, and colonizers um has happened to many indigenous European people through like other where? European, like whether it was the Romans or somebody came in and oppressed. And, and so this, this structure of, of, of power over rather than power with is a trauma that has also been a few hundred years earlier with the people who are now seen as the non-indigenous people. And I think it's in order to make this healing in this, like this return to our regenerative capacity as 
life as other the people. Only, only thing, Daniel, I would say uh, is to be indigenous, you have to be indigenous to land. Mm -hmm. uh, life is good, of course, and I agree with that. But life without land, industrial life is not life enough. Mm -hmm. So what, where we have become non-indigenous is when we have disconnected ourselves from nature, from land, from soil, and we live in a very kind of artificial um, environment, um, a closed environment uh, of air-conditioned houses and, and a centrally heated offices and, and a cars and, and, a, and a computerized and robotic lifestyle. So if we want to be indigenous, in my view, we have to be reconnected with the land, with nature. Absolutely. If we are connected with the land, then everybody is indigenous. Nobody is not indigenous. But when you become industrialized and disconnect yourself, from nature and from the soil and from the land and from the trees and the forest and you become dependent totally on supermarket provided food and, and a shopping uh, shopping malls for your clothes and shoes and, and the furniture. And so you are totally disconnected from the natural uh, life. The, for me, life is not in shopping malls and, 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 and life is not in supermarkets. Life is in nature and the land. So for me to be an indigenous, like you have the land, and that's the, you are indigenous. I have a garden, two acres of garden. I'm indigenous. We are indigenous, but we have to be connected with nature, with land, and with our real life, and not just artificial life of supermarkets and and a, and a shopping malls and an industrial system. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a it's a really good distinction to say that it's not just oh, we're all indigenous to life. Um, it's through that understanding of our nature as relational beings both in the human relational sense but also in the more than human relations that the deep ecology the understanding of of our ecological self is the larger land that we sit in and 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 the daily practice of caring for land yeah, um, exactly. again the, the the possible things of of privilege that some people don't have, are landless and 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 would like to have land but i uh, rather than going there I, there's i would like love to just use the remaining time to ask you to reflect because we, you've mentioned in your amazing life story um some encounters and and i've often wondered um i've never really asked satish in all these years um like how was it to when you after walking from india to Paris and Moscow and then London and then Bertrand Russell paid your um, ship voyage to New York so you could walk with Martin Luther King um, on, on, on the long march. And I, I believe you actually met the very young Titnat Han at that time too. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. I met Titnat Han actually in 1968 in Paris. Uh -huh. and I was very touched by his teachings already at that time. And then the Vietnam War and his work um, with the with the peace movement in, in in Europe and then also in America. And so I kept in touch with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and I uh, have been to Plum Village and, and his community. And I met him uh, maybe a couple of years before he um, became ill and 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 and, and, and went into to Vietnam. So it was a great privilege to meet him as well. And so this was wonderful. Uh, and Bertrand Russell, as you said, he was in a way inspiration to me uh, because at age 90, he was protesting against the nuclear weapons and he went to jail. And I said to myself that he is a man of 90 going to jail for peace in the world. What am I doing, a young man sitting here in, in Bangalore in India, drinking coffee in a coffee house? And so... This is amazing that how a 19-year-old man can inspire a 26-year-old young man to walk from India, from the grave of Mahatma Gandhi, to, as you said, to Moscow, Paris, London, Washington, to the grave of John F. Kennedy, and meet Martin Luther King, and meet Bertrand Russell, and meet Pearl Buck, and meet Thich Nhat Hanh, all the great teachers of our time. That was, uh, that was a real experience. And, you know, walking without money for 8,000 miles and two and a half years through 15 countries, that gave me so much 
kind of joy and experience. If I had stayed at home for two and a half years, I could not have learned anything. So mm -hmm. those were the two, I would say, most valuable, most fruitful, most joyful, and, and full of experience at those two and a half years. I could imagine that if you've lived that experience, then it's another way of of not like you you reminded me and i I'm, I'm grateful for that to not live from a kind of fear of what might be coming um at us but i think even on a daily basis when you walk through that many countries i mean you and you started the walk through walking through pakistan at the time where I, india and pakistan weren't particularly friendly with it each no, other. no they were at war yeah so so um i guess that's it's a such a deep practice of trusting that um a bit like the 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 Watzlat Havel quote again do i hope that i arrive in london hope hope is not knowing whether it's going to work out but um trusting it's the right thing anyway uh, daniel i also had a privilege of meeting vaclav havel yeah oh wow and and we had a discussion about active hope Mm -hmm. And Vaclav Havel said, the hope is not that something you sit down and wait for something to turn out. Hope is that you know what you want to achieve, where you want to go, and then you act for it. You put your energy, your imagination, your creativity, your time, your effort, everything to accomplish that hope. And so active hope, um, being engaged uh, in your uh, action. And and he was a great example, like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. He was imprisoned and he fought for the freedom of, of uh, Czech and Slovak Republic at that time. And now it's a Czech Republic. And, and when he became president, he was a great admirer of ecological movement, of uh, uh, Gaia, of James Lovelock and, and many other people like that. And he very kindly said that Schumacher College is wonderful. Um, if I was a free man, he was pre uh, president of uh, Czech Republic. So he said he was a free man. He would come and visit Schumacher College. But he invited me to Prague and and, and I met him. So it was a great privilege. And in, in all these journeys, is there any kind of particularly like an experience of where you where things seemed not that hopeful and then suddenly life continued like I, I could imagine you must have had some hardships on that journey um quite a few times and um how, how did life show up for you um in a there never hardship of course because if i did not want hardships i would have gone by aeroplane yeah. if i did not want uh, hardships i would have taken a car if I did not want hardship, I would have gone with a lot of money and stay in hotels and eat in restaurants. But I decided that I want to go in a hard way. I want to go on foot. I want to go without money. I want to be vegetarian. And I want to trust people, the strangers I will trust. And, and see what happens. And for two and a half years, without any money, I walked through Muslim countries, Christian countries, communist countries, capitalist countries, rich people, poor people, farmers, industrialists, every kind of person, universities, church people, mosque people, you name it. And in the morning when I start, I would not know where I will eat. I would not know where I will sleep. I would know nothing, but I will trust. Something will happen. Something will happen. And that way, trust was my treasure. Trust was my uh, checkbook. Trust was my visa card. Nothing else. Trust. And with that trust, I was looked after by strangers. And I was looked after by people whom I had never met. I was looked after by people whom I was never going to meet again. And yet, they opened their door. They cooked food for me. They gave their bed for me. They slept on the floor and put me in their, in their bed in poor houses. And so hospitality, people are good. I learned that. That's so important as a message because part of that kind of collapsing global industrial growth culture that, that needs to collapse is telling a story that people are competitive, 
only interested in their own benefit. Wouldn't they, why should I give um, care to a stranger if I don't have enough for my family? And it's the exact opposite. Ah, he is a stranger who is walking from India to London. I have a little, but what little I have, I will share. That's how exactly. most human beings work. Uh, exactly. That's exactly happened. Wonderful. That's so so powerful. To you. Well, what's your message to any young person that is maybe listening to this later? Um, My message to young people is very simple. Do not be afraid of hardship. Do not be afraid of difficulties. Do not be afraid of ups and downs. Life is here to teach us through difficulties, through ups and downs and problems. If we fear problems and difficulties, we will not be strong and resilient. A tree can only grow strong and resilient when it is standing in the snow, in the storm, in the winter, out in the field. If the tree is kept in the greenhouse, safe and secured, and without any storm, and without any rain, and without any snow, that tree is not going to be strong and resilient and live for 500 years or 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. So in order to make you strong and resilient, do not worry about problems and difficulties. Welcome them, face them, and solve them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's how life is. That's my simple message from my own experience. And I've never um, hoped that I have a life without problems. I've never thought that my body be without illness. I never believe that it can happen. I think illness is part of body. Problems are part of life. They come and we solve them and then we move on. But as long as I have a compassion and kindness and love in my heart, and respect for other people and have a politeness and humility and I speak sweet words and give love, I'll receive love. Mm -hmm. I've always received love. I've been married to my wife for more than 51 years and I'm every day receiving love because reciprocity, love is a reciprocity. You give, you get. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of love begets love and anger begets anger. So although I have received problems and difficulties and hardships, all that is fine, but I've never thought that I should become angry because of that or I should become upset because of that. I don't entertain anger or, or, or anything of that kind. I just accept problems and I live with them, I solve them, but I remain humble and, 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 and loving. Mm. The, the last thing that I... I suddenly thought of the, you must remember to ask satish about this is um i think a lot of people or not enough people know who vinoba pabe was and what he actually achieved the largest transfer of land in human history by exactly. peaceful means yeah from no, to the to to the poor and, and you walked with him what i mean this was early in your life what 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 made you join him and and tell me a bit more about how did all this happen like he walked all through india and managed to let people yes. give up land it's a very beautiful story daniel uh vinoba was almost a teacher of mahatma gandhi of course he was a friend and he was a colleague he was a member of gandhi's ashram and a community. But when the uh, non-violent resistance movement started, Gandhi asked Vinoba to be the first to offer the non-violent resistance ahead of himself. Because he said, you have pure heart and a pure consciousness. You have no anger and no arrogance and no animosity with anyone. So he was a very loving and non-violent person. And when uh, Gandhi passed away, and there was uh, in Andhra Pradesh, in South India, in one area of Telangana, there were riots because landless people were killing the landlords and they were being in jail. And police was there and the courts were there. And everything was very traumatic. So Vinoba went and said that we must solve this problem non-violently in a Gandhian way. So he went to the landlords and said, can you... Give land to the poor. This is why they are writing. And so landlords were very reluctant to give land. But 
he persuaded one landlord somehow to give 100 acres of land. And that gift stopped the riots. That gift stopped the violence. And it was a kind of miracle. And the newspapers and everybody, radio and everybody talking about it. So Vinoba said that this is not only a problem of one place. <laughs> this is the problem of the whole India and the whole world. Yes, that's so why. He said, I'm not going to go back to my community. I'm going to walk from village to village and ask the landlords to follow the example of this one man, one landlord who's giving 100 acres for the poor to be distributed. And so Vinoba said to the world, to India, that as we do not own the sunshine, we do not own the rivers, we do not own the rain, we do not own the air, we do not own the land. We have no ownership of the land. We have only relationship with the land. So give one sixth of your land and consider me your sixth child and give me one sixth of your land for the poor. And he went for 10 years <laughs> over 100,000 miles from north to south, from east to west, from central India, everywhere, 10 years, 100,000 miles. And he was a very saintly man. He was not asking for anything for himself. He was a very simple man. He was asking for the poor. And it was a miracle. It was a complete and total miracle. Nehru was flabbergasted that people are giving land for the poor. He came to Vinoba and said that we will legalize what you are getting. So Vinoba was given altogether over 10 year period, 4 million acres of land in gifts. And this land is not owned by anyone. It's a land owned in a community trust. And as long as you farm the land, you can keep it. The moment you stop farming the land, the community trust will give to somebody else who will farm the land. And so this is a kind of no ownership, community trust, and land is just cultivated for food and for, for cotton and for, uh, for fodder. So this was a, it's a beautiful, there is a, a website, Vinoba Bhave um, uh, website, you can look at, look it up. Uh, but I think it was a, my great privilege. I met Vinoba when I was a Jain monk. Because mm -hmm. my teacher, Jain leader, who was my teacher, organized a meeting with Vinoba. When Vinoba came on his walk for land gift and land distribution, he came to Delhi as well. And, and and my guru and I as a monk were in Delhi. So we met him. I was so inspired, so in, inspired by his work. I said, this is a real spiritual work. So one night after midnight, I escaped the monastic order and went to live in Vinoba's ashram and joined Vinoba walking from Kerala. Uh, I started in Kerala walking with him and I walked him in, in a kind of many uh, places of South India. And so this was a great privilege for me. And I was with Vinoba from 1955 um, uh, kind of to 1962. Uh, so there's a kind of great time. And I walked with him and I worked with him and I went to the landlords and persuaded in the name of Vinoba, in the name of the poor, in the name of God, in the name of the universe, in the, in the name of generosity, give land, give land. And people did. Wow. Because this is this this story is is a precedence of what I think. Like I was mentioning, these people working on bioregional regeneration, yeah? and there are now lots of people working on models like these intergenerational land trusts or gi giving. Like I, you probably know of this network of. Um, like there's a network called Nexus Global that unites. Um, the air generation of the really big fortunes in the world, like people who are going to inherit shortly 200, 300 million and more or billions. And even in the in those networks, our conversations now presence of how do we work with the privilege that we are given by our um, parents that have amassed these enormous fortunes in the exploitation of people and planet, directly or indirectly. And, and there, there is a willingness of, of people to transfer land into exactly what, what, what you, you know were describing. That's why it's so important to for people to learn about this story of saying, 
if you transfer your, your your land into this land trust, people will live on it, people will work it, and there will be people responsible for the trust as a wise oversight committee to ensure that the way the land is being worked is regeneratively, that that it it actually becomes more vibrant, more biodiverse, more healthy, rather than less vibrant and less healthy. And a, as long as people do that, even their children can inherit the right to be on the land and continue to work the land. And mm -hmm. and it's this kind of, in, in the larger transformation to making us all indigenous again, in what you were saying earlier, it's not just we're indigenous to life, we have to be in direct lived relationship with the place we're in, we have to work the land in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, that's why why I think the, these stories, in, in so many ways, the, the Gandhian story and Binuba Pabe's story is, for me, a hopeful example that doesn't come from the industrialized north, comes from India, yeah. the most populated country in the world. Um, and it's offering us a pathway. The, mm -hmm. the Gandhian non-violence, self-reliance framing is is really the the way out of um this dead end of industrial growth society. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Good. So thank you. Uh, that was a great lovely. conversation. It Daniel. Was thank you so uh, much. Do what you me. like with it. Edit it as you like it and make it what you like. It's yours. And it's a great pleasure to see you on the screen and wish you well and good health and good spirit and take easy, take rest. Life is to enjoy and life is to give and, and, and love. And that's life is not worry about anything else. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm um, moved to tears and gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a lovely evening. You too. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.